It's unbelievable, but this is ShareFest's fourth year. 50 churches, 5,000 volunteers loving the Grand Valley. And here at the Vineyard, our role is we're going to love Kenwood Park and we're going to go love people who have put in their requests, mostly widows, orphans, and veterans. So I'd love to show you a little bit what we have going on this day. So what does it look like? On Saturday morning, April 30th, we're going to gather here in Kimwood and we're going to go out into the streets. And all the skills that you need is to, if you can push a lawnmower, if you can rake, if you can pick up, we can use you. From young to old, from male to female. And you know, one like this house here, this is a wonderful lady who has four kids, single mom, too much house, to not enough time. If we put 10 people on this house, we could have this house completely cleaned up within an hour. So what do you need to do? Come up to the SC desk and we can get you signed up. If raking leaves and picking up trash and mowing yards really isn't your thing, and you have a little bit more skill, then we got 100 projects from widows, orphans, and veterans that turned those in. Like this house right here. This lady here, a, year, a couple years ago, she was selling meth in her home. She came with an encounter with Jesus. Now her home is for a Bible study here every Wednesday night. But her home is in desperate need of repair. Every time it rains, the rain comes leaking through. And we need some roof repairs. So here's your opportunity to show the love of Christ to a community who's in desperate need of it. So please, come to the Severini desk, sign up today. Let's just see what Jesus is going to do on April 30th and May 1st. Dear Lord, baby Jesus, or as our brothers to the south call you, Jesus, we thank you so much for this bountiful harvest of Domino's, KFC, and the always delicious Taco Bell. Dear tiny infant Jesus. Hey, we... um, you know, sweetie, Jesus did grow up. You don't always have to call him baby. It's a bit odd and off-putting to pray to a baby. Well, look, I like the Christmas Jesus best, and I'm saying grace. When you say grace, you can say it to grown-up Jesus or teenage Jesus or bearded Jesus or whoever you want. You know what I want? I want you to do this grace good so that God will let us win tomorrow. <sighs> your tiny Jesus, your golden fleece diapers with your tiny little fat balled up fist pawing. He was a man. He had a beard. Look, I like the baby version the best. Do you hear me? I win the races and I get the money. I like to picture Jesus in a tuxedo t-shirt because it says like... I want to be formal, right. but I'm here to party, too. Because I like to party, so I like my Jesus to party. I like to picture Jesus as a ninja fighting off evil samurai. I like to think of Jesus, like, with giant eagle's wings yeah. and singing lead vocals for Leonard Skinner with, like, an angel band. And I'm in the front row, and I'm hammered drunk. Hey, Cal, why don't you just shut up? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Dear, eight pound, six ounce, Newborn infant Jesus, don't even know a word yet. We just thank you for all the races I've won and the $21.2 million. Woo! 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 Ow! Love that money that I have accrued over this past season. Also due to a binding endorsement contract that stipulates I mentioned Powerade at each grace. I just want to say that Powerade is delicious mm. and it, it cools you off on a hot summer day. And we look forward to Powerade's release of Mystic Mountain Blueberry. Mm. Thank you for all your power and your grace, dear baby God. Amen. 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 Let's dig in. Amen. Excuse me, indigestion. Is that me? There you go. 
Well, to some of you, that video we showed is probably sacrilegious. And please forgive us. There's a point to it that I want us to see. And the point that I wanted to make with showing that video is that there are people that have a distorted view of who Jesus really is. And that distorted view of Jesus really affects and impacts what we do. And it's critical for us, if we choose to be disciples that want to follow Jesus, is we have to know who he really is. As we're going through this series, uh, going up to uh, the Easter weekend, we're looking at Jesus as the man. We're going to look at Jesus today as the Lord. And then next week, we will look at Jesus as the Christ. Our view needs to be a true biblical view of Jesus. And when we take an honest look at who Jesus is and we look at the things he said, then we're faced with a choice. The choice is, do we choose to follow the real Jesus or do we want to make up a Jesus that is more palatable to us? Like you saw in the video there, that that's a Jesus that was a self-serving Jesus, wasn't it? a Jesus that would help them to win the races so he can win more money for themselves. That is really, obviously, not a biblical view of who Jesus is. And so that's our pursuit today. And, you know, one of the things that I have seen in my life is the more that I pursue Jesus and the more I try to understand him, the more I realize how much I don't understand. Is anyone in this room uh, kind of the same way? And the things that I talk about today may be truly challenging for us, that as we look at Jesus as the Lord, it really does kind of force us to make a decision and to kind of do some soul searching. Do I really look at Jesus as my Lord? Now, one of the things that Jane and I have been hit right smack between the eyes is the reality that when you understand a person and you understand their background and you understand their experiences, it really impacts and affects how you respond to them. And and many of you know this, that Jane and I, with the kids, uh, we have um, an 18-year-old biological son, Joey, and uh, Wade is 21 and is married to a wonderful young gal named Chelsea. But later in life, when we were getting a little dementia, We decided to do this thing called adoption that God put in our heart. And so four years ago, we adopted little Gracie, who's now five, from China when she was 13 months old. And then uh, a little over a year ago, 14 months ago, we brought home Gertie from Haiti, who is now 11. And one of the things that we began to really notice, especially working with Gertie, was that the reality that Gertie was not bonding with us, that you could just tell that there was this barrier, this wall around her heart, and she wouldn't let us in. And this is after 14 months. And so we did some research, and we found this woman by the name of Nancy Thomas. And uh, Nancy Thomas is a God-fearing, loving woman that got on her knees and started asking God how to help kids with reactive attachment disorder to get healed. And God started downloading all these principles to her. And for the past 30 years, her life has been committed to helping kids with attachment disorder to get healed to the point that they can have a normal, responsible, productive life and be able to have true, loving relationships. So we found out about Nancy, and we actually went to her ranch last week for a week. And we did this thing called a family intensive for a whole week with Nancy Thomas and with this therapist named James that is another godsend that uh, Nancy says he's the best attachment therapist in the world. And after spending a week with him, we agree. It was truly an amazing week. But one of the things that we came to understand was that uh, Gertie in particular, her issues are so different than a normal kid because of her experiences the first 10 years of life. And so we have Joey, who's 18, and Wade, who's 21, and we raise them up uh, a certain way, and using what many of you have heard, love and 
um, love and natural consequences, and, and they've grown up to be great kids, and they, they're really loving, sensitive, strong, uh, caring young men. And so we were trying to do the same thing with Gertie, and, and she just wasn't responding. And what we learned was our normal way of parenting to a normal kid was actually making her worse and pushing her away from us, because it was a sign of weakness as we as parents uh, were trying to give her choices. And, and so anyway, I don't want to go into all the details, but the reality is, is Jane and I had to learn that we were dealing with a different animal. And we had to totally shift how we parent uh, her, and we, we also learned some stuff about Gracie. And uh, saw some amazing things come out of Gracie's heart through therapy that I would have never, never known. And it was incredibly powerful. And that's another story. But the, the point that I'm making is uh, we have learned that, that they need something different than what our boys needed because of their attachment issues. And, and Jane and I are, are trying to implement the things we're learning. And it's, it's like learning how to do uh, ride a bicycle a totally different way. And uh, granted that we have to keep reminding ourselves we're not supposed to do that or we're supposed to do this this way and, and Jane and I are kind of helping coach each other. But the reason I, I say that is I think in a similar vein, many of us who have a distorted view of Jesus, we, we approach him a certain way and when we are approaching him in a way that is contrary to scripture and things happen in our life, that's when many of us get sideways with God. And that's when we get disillusioned. That's when we get disappointed. That's when we get angry at God. But when we have a real clear biblical view of who the Lord presents himself to us to be through the scriptures, it really helps us to get centered with him. And that's really our goal through going through the book of Romans. As we go through the book of Romans, it is the best book in the Bible that teaches us good, clear theology so that we can become disciples that reach the unreached. And that's our goal in going through the book of Romans. And I think you will find that it will be ex extremely helpful for all of us to look at this book and see what Paul is trying to communicate to the Romans. Now, last week I understand that Nate said something that was uh, maybe uh, misunderstood by a number of people that were, oh, oh, oh. And, uh, and what Nate was trying to say was Nancy Thomas was very concerned about Gracie, who's five, with Gertie, an unattached girl without a conscience in the home. Naturally, what, what Nancy was very concerned about was, was Gracie's safety. And so one of the goals in the therapy was to see if Gracie had, a, or Gertie had any uh, serious issues in her past that were kind of skeletons in the closet that were endangering Gracie in a physical or, or a sexual way. And, uh, and fortunately, through all the therapy that we did, there were no issues that they found. And, so they very comfortably said, uh, Gertie is very safe to be at home with Gracie, that we don't have any concerns in those areas. So, so that's what Nate was trying to communicate, and people were thinking that we were throwing Gracie, our Gertie away, and that's not what was happening. We were just trying to assess how safe Gracie was in the home with Gertie. Does that make sense? So anyway... Don't throw Nate under the bus. He wasn't trying to do anything that was misrepresented us. Um, so as we go through our life of seeing the miracle of healing in our daughter's lives, one of the things that God wants us to understand is, is his goal is to bring ultimately freedom and healing in each of our lives. Now, I don't know if that sounds like a good thing for you. Would you like to have freedom in your life? And would you like to really know that you have a purpose and, and that God has you here for a reason? If, if that was to be presented through going through the book of Romans, would you want to know that? 
And I hope, you, I hope you do, because that's where we really find a sense of purpose in living is when we see why we're here. So when you look at a video like we saw from Talladega Nights, obviously that's not the Jesus that is presented in the scriptures. It's as far from the truth as we can see. But one thing that we need to understand is that in the church in America, and I'm, I'm talking about in a general sense, the reality is, is that the gospel, our Jesus, has been watered down. And what I mean by that, it's been watered down in, in, a, in a way that actually retards us, or limits us, or inhibits us from being able to truly respond to God the way he really wants us to respond to him. I think that the church has really watered the gospel down in a sense of just come and get saved. You know, because you want to get to heaven. And there's this place that the church isn't even able to talk about anymore. And it's a place that's supposed to be hot and burning and, and suffering, and, and it's spelled H-E-L-L, but we, we're not supposed to talk about that in the church anymore. And many of us, we just want to make sure we don't go there. And so we come and we hear the gospel, we hear the news about Jesus Christ as our Savior, and we say the prayer and we get saved. But there's a second part of the gospel that we need to understand is that Jesus is presented scripturally as the Lord and Savior. And many of us leave the Lord part out. It's not palatable to us. Because we don't want a God that's going to infringe on our lifestyle. We just want a God that's going to make life easier for us, make life more comfortable for us, make life more successful. And that's the kind of gospel that we want, that kind of tickles our ears. But when I see the scriptures, there's a totally different picture of the gospel that I see. And as we're just covering in these three weeks, the first four verses of Romans, it says, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel are the good news of God. The gospel he promised beforehand through the prophets in the Holy Scriptures. And the Holy Scriptures that Paul is talking about is the Old Testament Scriptures, the Hebrew Scriptures regarding his son, Jesus Christ, who as to his human nature was a descendant of David. So one thing we need to understand that Nate was talking about last week was Jesus was born into humanity, that God actually became flesh and became man. That's a very important thing that we need to understand. Because if we don't understand Jesus actually becoming man, we don't understand the true suffering that he experienced on the cross. And who through the spirit of holiness was declared with power to be the son of God by his resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ our what? Lord. Okay, you guys are really good right in here. I heard that real clearly. So you guys in this middle section, give each other a high five. You got it down. You guys over here, pretty weak, man. Let's, let's hear that again. That Jesus our Lord. Lord. Okay. So the distinction that he's making here is that Jesus is our Lord. But do we really understand that? Are, are we getting a handle and are we really living out a response to Jesus as our Lord? Now, Jesus as our Lord, there is an incredible uniqueness about Jesus Christ that we don't see in any other man, any other God, is that he became man, lived among us. He was fully man, yet fully God, which if you ask me to try to explain that, the theologians for centuries have been trying to explain that, and it's, it's beyond my scope of intelligence to be able to do that, but to be able to grasp in one man who's fully God, fully man, who died for us on the cross, who him who was sinless became sin on our behalf. And then 
through the power of God, the Father resurrected him from the dead. That that is what qualifies him to be our Lord. There's no other man that has done that. And so when we encounter the real Jesus, we need to understand that the real Jesus changes us. It turns our world upside down. It changes us in a way that it changes the way we think, it changes the way we feel, and it changes what we do. It really does. Because when we accept Jesus as our Lord, then he says, follow me. And then we have that choice. Do we truly follow Jesus? Are we really going to live our life according to the way the scriptures tell us to live? Because, you know, when you really look at the things that Jesus tells us to do, did you know that there's some things that I really don't like that Jesus said to do? I mean, it just kind of irks me that Jesus says to forgive or you won't be forgiven. Why does he have to say that? He says, you got to love your enemies. We've talked about that a lot. Are you kidding me? Now, so how many in this room have been hurt very deeply by someone who used to love you? Many of you are shaking your hands. How many of you have been violated in a way by a person that was supposed to protect you? How many of us have someone who betrayed us, who abandoned us and have left our lives? And we're supposed to love them? We're supposed to forgive them? You know, it's things like this that I just wish Jesus didn't say. But if Jesus is my Lord, I have to pray and I have to cry out to God and say, God, you got to give me the grace to do this because it's not in me, right? But that's the reality. If we're truly going to be a disciple of Jesus, we have to be on our knees and say, God, if you want me to do this, you've got to give me the power to do it. And that's the exciting thing about life in Christ is when we do that, the Holy Spirit comes in, the Holy Spirit empowers us, and the Holy Spirit is the one who allows us to love our enemies. It's crazy. I don't know if any of you experienced that, but there may be people in your life right now. As I'm talking about this, you're going, oh, no. Uh-uh. I ain't going to love that person. Well, you know what? Scripturally, we don't have a choice. If we really make Jesus our Lord. I, I found this quote from Alfred Lord Tennyson from the 1500s. And he was talking about the Archbishop of England. His name was Cramner. And he said, Archbishop Cramner, to do him a hurt was to beget a kindness from him. His heart was made of such fine soil that if you planted in it the seeds of hate, they blossomed love. I'm not an Archbishop Cramner. But there's something about hearing a quote like this that here's a guy that's the heart of Jesus. I think this is a guy who saw Jesus as his Lord. And the Holy Spirit gave Archbishop Bishop Cramner the ability to love in this way that even when he was hurt by somebody, what blossomed out of that hurt was love in return. So one of the things about a watered-down gospel is that I think the church has kind of repackaged Jesus. You know, back in, uh, in 85, there was a new campaign that was started by a major corporation. You guys remember, for those of you that are old enough to remember, do you remember the new Coke? You remember that? It, this huge, elaborate uh, campaign of marketing that they have this new Coke that they said was smoother, rounder, yet bolder. And they did this in competition to the rise of popularity of Pepsi. It failed abysmally. It was a huge debacle. Just like back in the 80s, there was this thing called Zima, clear bill, clear beer. 
Anyone remember Zima? It tasted like formaldehyde. <laughs> like, I never tasted it, though, but that's what I heard. Eight-track cassettes. Anyone have eight-track cassettes in your garage still? Those things failed miserably, thinking that if they just repackage something, it'll become successful, and everyone will accept it. That's what the church has done with Jesus, that they repackage a more sanitized Jesus that will never make any claims on a person and won't make them change anything. We just want people to come in the door. You understand what's happened in the church in America? We've marketed Jesus, and we've left out the truth. But the American church needs to understand that what Jesus is calling us to is a life of a disciple, a life of being sold out to him and following him. But we want a Jesus that serves us. Now, some of you are thinking, well, yeah, I, I'm with you, Kirk. I understand what you're saying. I'm, I'm behind you. Preach it, brother. But let me ask you a question. This is kind of for all of us. If Let's use your imagination if you've been coming to Canyon View for a while, but you're coming here for the first time. What are the things we're looking for when we go to a church for the first time? How is the music? Do I like the music? What is the atmosphere in the church like? Is it comfortable? Are the chairs comfortable? Is it air-conditioned? Are, are we going to get hot in the summer there? Is there good parking out in the parking lot? What is the children's ministry like? I want to make sure that my kids have a good time in ch kids' church. Do they have a youth program? And will, will my kids like going to the youth program? You see, all of those are things that has, the church has marketed itself. And so if we have come to church looking for those things, then we're all guilty of that. I, I know that I am. I want a church that I like. Fortunately, I love this church, especially because of Ronnie Higuera. I love Ronnie Higuera, my brother. <laughs> He's so good looking. But how many times do we go to a church and we say, I want a church that is going to treat teach the full truth of the scriptures, and I want to find a church that has a ministry that I can get involved in so that I can have a life that is making an eternal difference in the life of another person. Do you see the difference? There's a huge difference between those two questions. And I think what God wants is the second because I really do believe that God calls us to lay down our lives and follow him for the purpose of his kingdom. And that's why we are promoting Romans as building disciples, growing disciples to reach the unreached, because that's what God calls us to do. Now, I have this smartphone. These are amazing little things. And this smartphone, by a certain company that I won't name, has 300,000 apps that you can get on this phone right now. Now, this app that I have on here is called Golf Logics. I don't know how this got on my phone. It was just there, <laughs> just appeared out of nowhere. But I looked at this, and it, and it has a free club membership. But if you want the full bells and whistles, you can become a premium member by paying only $20 a year. Now, why would I get the premium? Why would I pay the cost for that when everything I need is in the free part of the app? Obviously, I'm not going to pay $20 to use something that, to put something on this phone that I'll never use. But you know what? That's the way we look at the gospel. We want what's free. But if it's going to cost us anything, we run for cover. And, you know, when you look at the New Testament disciples, what I see is a group of people that were way different than me. What, what I see is a group of people that were willing to say yes to follow Jesus no matter what the cost. 
that they laid down their 